this morning. We're glad you're here and glad to be in the house of God. In fact, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say you're in the right place at the right time right now. I believe that today and we're just glad you came to the house of God and all those that are watching online. What a blessing to be together. But we are going to continue this series that we've been talking about the last couple of months and we've been talking about the Hebrew names of God and most people would think, well, what is that? How does that apply to my life? What God's name is? And I want to tell you, it really does apply to your life more than you think. And one of the, uh, the series that we've called this is Yahweh, which is one of the biblical names of God. And uh, because God's name is so holy back, especially in Old Testament times, so holy to pronounce. And so they call him Yahweh, meaning he's almighty and all powerful. But there are many names or titles that were given to God. And each name of the Lord is the description of his character. Each name is the declaration of his commitment to his people. And God does everything that his name declares. And what I want to say before I pray, that his name reveals his identity. His name reveals who he is. And if you want to know who God, who God is, you need to be acquainted and familiar with his name. So I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask the Lord to help us as we dive into this message today. So Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you this morning that your word is powerful, and that your word is relevant, that it applies to our life in 2023, that it's not outdated, it's not old-fashioned, but God today, right now where we live in, in the time that we live in, the word of God is real. The word of God applies to us. So remove every distraction. Remove every weight that's on our mind today. And Lord, kind of remove any cloud in our heart, Lord, so that we can hear clearly what the Word of God has to say. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and I pray that people would hear the voice behind the voice. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. So let me ask you a question, those that are coming here, and you've been, uh, you're a regular that you come here uh, regularly on Sundays or Wednesdays. My question to you is, why do you come to church? Why do you come to church? And some of you today, maybe you were invited, and you're visiting today, and you're even surprised. I don't know what I'm doing here. And so I want to welcome you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but those of us that come regularly, ask yourself that question, why do you come? I mean, do you come because we have great coffee? That's pretty good. Maybe you come for the food in the cafe. That's really good. <laughs> Uh, I don't get a chance to eat it, you know, because I've got to preach the following service and everybody's showing me all the great quesadillas and everything else. It's really good. Or maybe you feel like, hey, you know, I do, I'm just checking in with God. And so I'm, I'm coming to church, you know, I'm kind of checking in. But how many really come for God to make a difference in your life? Oh, I'll put it this way. How many come because you need to grow and you need to change? I mean, if you're really honest with yourself, you can say, man, I need, I need to change. And you may say, well, w maybe you're out there saying, well, you know, I'm okay. How many can admit, you know, I, I need God to help me with my pride. I can be a little less prideful. I can be a little less angry, a little less fearful, a little less selfish, a little less jealous, am I right? A little bit more patient with the children, right? With your kids. All of these things. Maybe I, maybe, you know, I need some change. I can worry less. And so all of us would have to admit we do need a degree of change. And God gives himself a name in, in, uh, in the Old Testament where he declares himself that he is the God that will change you. And this is the name he gives himself, Jehovah Mekadesh, Mekadesh. In other words, I am the God who sanctifies you. I am the God who sanctifies you. So sanctification, what it means is to purify you. It means to clean you. It means to change you. And let me just tell you about sanctification. 
It's a process. It's not an instant thing that happens. Sanctification is a process for, if you're a believer, it starts at the point of salvation and it ends in glorification. It begins when you start serving Jesus and it ends when you get into glory with Jesus. It doesn't matter where you've been, how long you've been serving God. All of us, if we're honest with God or if we're honest with ourselves, we need some change. And if you're a Christian, God's already changing you. But how many know God is still at work? You're not finished yet. In fact, your wife or your husband tell you, yeah, you've got a lot, got a lot of work to get done, right? Now, here's the good news, again, because it's not finished yet, and he's still in the process. If you're a, a person barely coming and kind of checking it out, the good news is you don't have to get all cleaned up to come to God. You don't got to get all your stuff. You come to God, and God helps you change. That's the good thing. You don't have to get your act together before you come to Christ. God begins to work in your life. In fact, the scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that if anyone, that means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new creation or new person, the old life, say old life, life. is gone. And the new life has begun. And so he's referring the old life, he's referring to an old life without Christ. It's an old life before you knew God in your life, and the old life, a lot of stuff that we did, a lot of sin, a lot of things that we did, and it's the old spiritual nature. It's the old way of thinking. And said so the new life has begun. It's talking about a new way of thinking. How many know you go from God's creation to God's child? You belong to Christ, and all of us today at one time we were lost, but now we've been found. And so this new life is the process of being sanctified or the process of God changing you. In fact, let me read how Paul the Apostle wrote this. Paul the Apostle wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. And look at what he said. This is an apostle of God that God used early on. It says, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, I don't mean to say I've already achieved these things. I've already reached perfection. In other words, I haven't arrived yet. But I keep working toward the day when I finally be all that Christ saved me, uh, uh, saved for, saved me for, and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm still not all I should be. Thank God. But I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing. I'm forgetting the things, uh, or forgetting the past, and looking toward what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race. Thank God. I, to receive the prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us up to heaven. So the ideal here is that we're in a new race. We're in a new journey. And this journey is the process. And God wants to change us from being discontent to a place of peace. God wants to change us from a place of insecurity to a place of joy. He wants to change you from being bitter to better. He wants to change you from having lust to to having genuine love. Uh, He wants to change you from having this edgy personality to someone that displays some patience. Uh, God is in the changing business. Uh, God wants to take the anger and the rage and give you some gentleness about your life because God is a God that changes us and sanctifies us. In fact, one of our values in our church is change is my friend. Change is not an enemy. I know most of us don't like change. It's probably because you need the change. (laughs) We need the change, right? And so some of you might be out there saying, well, that sounds good for you, Pastor, but, you know, for me, that's a little bit more difficulty, more difficult for God to do in my life. You know, it's a little hard for me. And I just want to say to you, many people probably have heard this or maybe you've said this before in your life, and you say, well, when it comes to change, you know, this is just the way I am. You know, this is my culture. You know, this, this is my family bloodline. I've heard all that prideful stuff. And we say all that, and it's almost like God says, oh, yeah, 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 you're from that side of the tracks. Oh, I get it. Oh, oh you're, you're from that culture. Oh, yeah, you don't, we don't need to work on that then. We, we need to work. I apologize. Oh, I forgot you were from there. 
Oh, I forgot, oh, it's your family line. How many know God doesn't work that way? We're all flawed, right? In fact, when we come to being flawed, we look at ourselves and say, man, why am I so flawed in my life? Why is my life so bad, right? And the reality is God does need to change us. And God is up to something. So here's a couple of things I want to help you with today when it comes to change and transformation in our life. And there's two extremes that we begin to think about or the, in our philosophy that are not biblical. This is not Bible, but most of us, this is the way we think. Number one, we, take, we think that all the change, God does it. So if Jehovah... Mikadesh, in other words, it's all up to him. So we just come to God, we just kind of kick back and just watch God do the work. We just say, God, just transform me. God, you know, I'm just going to kick back on the couch here and watch you do it all. And if we don't change, it's not our fault, it's God's fault. Uh, honey, yeah, you know, God just, he did a bad job. He messed up. He dropped the ball when it came to me. You know, I, I was waiting for God to change me, but it just never happened. So therefore, I'm not responsible and I'm not accountable. Okay, so we think it's all up to God. He's going to do all the changes. Number two, the false uh, that is not biblical is we think it's all up to us. In other words, I got to put in the work. I got to, you know, try to transform my behavior. I got to do this. I got to work hard. And if we don't change, we didn't work hard enough. We didn't do enough for the change. Now, let me give you what the Bible says when it comes to sanctification and how God changes us. Are you ready for this? Write this down. God does his part, all right, and we do our part. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. I thought you just said we didn't do him. Let me qualify what I'm saying. God does his part, and we do our part. What is our part? Our part is cooperation. Okay, God's part, it's his power, and then it takes your cooperation. God does the work through us and in us, but we have to surrender our will and submit to his will, and he does the work. A lot of the reasons why we're not changing, there's no transformation, it isn't that God's power is not available and God's power can't do it, is that you're not submitting and surrendering. You're not cooperating with God. Well, can I stop God? Yeah, your stubbornness, your pride, your culture, your family line. I'm from this family line. I'm this person. I'm this, you know. This is my race. You know, you're prideful in your race, all that. We're all created by God. I don't care what your bloodline is and what island you're from. What, you know, oh my gosh. You know, just, just can't even... I just, I get sick of it. Anyway, when, <laughs> you're a person. Don't blame all these things. God, we cooperate, and God is in the changing process. Through the Holy Spirit, he works through us as we cooperate. If you miss this, you, must, you misunderstand the sanctification process and the change. It's not just God, and it's not just you. It's God's power and you cooperating. When you cooperate with God, you'll begin to see some of your habits begin to change. Some of the way you think begins to change. Are you with me so far? So write this down. We're going to go over our first point here. Your spiritual life is a journey, okay? It's not a quick walk. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Maybe we could put some of those pictures up as, as I'm going here, okay? So it's a marathon, it's a marathon. You, 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 you got it. You got it, it. It's a journey. It's not a quick walk, right? It's not like you're going through the subway. You're not, it, it, it's, it's a marathon. God's changing process is not an event. It's a journey. How many thank God for that? Not a shortcut. Look at what it says, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I'm sure that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ comes back. So you're not going to be a finished product until Jesus comes or you're in the presence of God. 
This is all, but the work that he's begun is still working. It will continue until it finally comes to that place. So again, it began at salvation, and it continues in this journey that we're walking with God. So let me give you an example of this, and some of you might have experienced it. When you get ready to go on a road trip, and all of your children are involved, they're packing. How many know when everybody's getting, get, you know, ready to get on this road trip, everybody's excited. Show that picture, please. Everybody's excited. And how many know kids are laughing? We're having a great time. We're going on the road trip. Man, we're, we're headed, you know, and you, you know, you're headed somewhere. And how many know by time you get about an hour in the drive, what do the kids say? Are we, wow, yeah, you got it. Are we there yet? Why don't you put that picture up? Please, follow what I'm doing here. Are, are we there yet? No, the other picture. You're the, that's the wrong picture. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? There's another one where it says, are we there yet? It literally says, are we there yet? Okay, but maybe, I don't know what they did with that picture, but there's a picture where the kids are saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And, and they're, you know, they're, they're doing it, and then... And then after a while, how many know that the kids start fighting? You can show that picture now. Uh, the kids are fighting. They're kind of pushing each other. Or they don't even fight. They go, he's touching me. He's touching me. Or he's looking at me. He's looking at me. It's like, my God, let him look at me. He's looking at me. Dad, he's looking at me. Why don't we go back and drop him off? I mean, so it started exciting. It was great, and then it was impatient. Are we there yet? And then you're just on each other's nerve. Am I right? And, and then we always say that if I have to pull over, and you never pull over, it's just talk. If I have to pull over right now, just talk, talk. Sometimes it does settle them down like, oh, man, we better calm down. But it's just talk. So what is this? What is this sign? Are we there yet? You know what it's a sign? It's a sign of immaturity. Because kids don't realize, listen to me, they don't realize the amount of planning that it takes to go somewhere. They don't realize the amount of money it takes for the destination you're gonna get to, the gas, all of that. They don't realize any of that. And so out of their immaturity, they keep saying, are we there yet? This is the reason why many people walk away from God and they walk away from church, and they turn their back on God because they look at themselves and say, man, there's no change, there's nothing. Are we there yet? It's your spiritual immaturity. You're saying, man, where is the change? Where is the transformation? It doesn't work for me. I, I, I might as well just go back. I'm going to leave church because, you know, I'm no different today than I was the last time. And so we see ourselves, are we there yet? And are we there yet is a sign of immaturity. You don't understand the sanctification process. You don't understand that God is still at work in your life. Some people say, man, you know, it's been a week. I've, I've been coming to church for a week. Where's the change? Man, I've been coming for a month. What's going on here? You know, I'm, I'm going to leave because we're, we're an instant gratification society. We want everything instantly. We think microwave. God doesn't work like a microwave. We think, man, instantly like a drive through you know, and, and, you know, if things aren't, mo you're honking the horn in the drive through How many times have you gotten an elevator and you keep pushing the button? As if the elevator says, oh, man, I better get up there real quick. The guy's pushing the button. Or how many have done this at a crosswalk? You're pushing that button. <laughs> Did you know, really, they said most of those buttons don't even work? <laughs> they, they said that, that they don't even maintenance them. And then some of those buttons, actually, when it's a lot of traffic, it defaults to regular timing. So no matter how much you time, it's dysfunctional at that time. At a certain time when there's traffic, that thing is off, so I don't care you just do that. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Am I right? And a lot of us, we're like that with God. We're pushing the button. We're saying, God, where is the chain? How many of God's equation of time is not our equation of time? God knows his part. You just got to cooperate with his. See, we're a work in progress. Some of you that are married said, man, is this as good as it gets? 
Thank God it doesn't. Amen. God's working on that man. God's working on that woman. It's still a work in progress. Can you say amen? Some of you that are here, you've been coming a while, you say, man, uh, the pastors here, they're very transparent. Why? Because we know the process of sanctification. I'll talk about my faults. I'll talk about my shortcomings. I'll let you know that I'm, no, I'm not perfect. I'm a work in progress. Can I tell you, I've been serving the Lord for 42 years, and God's still working on me. Hallelujah. I don't have it all together. I'll be the first one. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. I'm still a work in progress. I, God is doing the work, and I'm just cooperating. Number two, are you ready for this? Set your sights on the final destination because this is not your final stop in life. How many know when you get ready to map something out, you usually, you, you, you're looking at it and, and you say, you know, for instance, if you're going from Paramount to La Jolla, I can't believe we can't blow that up better, but anyway, Paramount to La Jolla, if you were planning that out, you, you, you know, you do the red dot to the blue dot, right? And you say, man, I'm getting, and let's just say you were going to La Jolla and you were going to one of those premier uh, villas in La Jolla. And what keeps you in going in destination is you keep looking at those pictures and say, man, we're going to go there. And you say, wow, we're going to have this scenery. And man, how many know that keeps you motivated in the journey? Because, yeah, I wish I could go there, too. <laughs> I wish my, our church would send us there, honey, for our, our anniversary that's coming up, July 28th. That would be so nice. In fact, July 28th, my wife and I will be we're married 39 years. I didn't plan that, but that's pretty good, huh? Anyway, so... I wish they would send us there. Anyway, so, so here's what the Bible, I mean, here's what the Bible, here's what happens as we're planning on this journey, the pictures of the final destination keep us motivated. You got to remember, we're not there yet. We haven't arrived yet. Our destination is eternity with Jesus. Can you say amen? It's to be in the presence of God. Look at what it says in Hebrews 10.10. 10. It says, and what God wants is for us to be made holy Leviticus 20 says, set yourselves apart to be holy, for I am the Lord, your God, who makes you holy. Now, that word holiness, a lot of us are a little like afraid or intimidated, like holy. There's no way I can be holy. What that word holy means is to be set apart. Not above everybody else, but set apart from the world's way of thinking. In other words, you're set apart from everybody else. So, in other words, when God sets us apart, he's saying, I, the way God does it when he sets us apart, he says, I, you now belong to me. You now belong to me. I'm the owner. And when he sets us apart, he had the purpose and use for us. And the final destination in this holiness is being in the presence of God. And so a lot of us say, well, man, you know, I keep messing up, you know, and can I tell you, that's part of the sanctification process. We're all going to mess up. I just told you earlier, I don't have it all together. That's actually consistent with scripture, but we have to keep allowing God and surrendering and let God work the process. Can you say amen? And so when we talk about change, it's not about, about us doing it, it's about us being it. It's surrendering and saying, I want to be what God wants me to be. It's not me working at it. It's me surrendering and me being what God wants me to be. We talk a lot around here. When you come into church, uh, you belong here. A lot of churches, when you come here, we got to get you to believe. And then after you believe, then you'll begin to behave. And then after you behave, then you'll begin to belong here. No, we, we believe this. When you walk into these doors, you belong here already. We pray that as you come, you'll begin to believe. And as you begin to believe in God, you'll begin to behave. God will change your behavior. And after that, you'll become all God wants you to be. And so we're talking about becoming. We're talking about becoming what God wants us to be, not so much trying to work into doing it. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, and as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, he's working in us, we become what? More and more like him. 
and we reflect his glory even more. So how do we become more like Christ? How do we become more like God wants to be? Not being, we're not talking about being more religious. You have to, you know, say certain rituals, do certain things. We're talking about becoming more like Jesus. It's the relationship, right? And so I want to just tell you today that it's a relationship with God that helps you become all God wants you to be. Now, let me just say this to many of you because many times we feel like, man, I, I'm not making any progress. We start comparing ourselves with people. It used to be when I first became a believer, I was impressed by what people did and what they said. In other words, man, I'm so impressed because this person prayed so much. This person gave words. This person knew the Bible. I was so impressed by people. I was impressed by their gifting. I was impressed by their knowledge. And somehow, in my mind, I would equate because they know the Bible, because they pray that way, because they, give, they have these gifts, they must be closer to God than I am. And I've learned through the years that you can have all the Bible knowledge, you can have all the giftings, but if you don't apply it to your life, it means nothing. I've seen these same people not love, not be humble, be prideful, unforgiving, have issues that they won't let God break in their life. Are you with me? And yet, they may have all the gifting. They, you may have all the... Let me just tell you something. You may know the book, but do you know the author of the book? You may have all the Bible knowledge. You may be able to quote scriptures. I'm not impressed by that. I'm impressed by people's character. I'm impressed by the chain that God has made in their life. When I see somebody, let me tell you what ought to really get your attention. When somebody humbly has rearranged their life and all of a sudden they're mentoring others and they're being an example to others. In other words, these guys, when you're not watching, they're still living for God. When nobody's looking at them, they are still pleasing God. When they begin, their, what they're preaching matches what they believe and their lifestyle. They've arranged their, their finances, the way they walk with God. They've changed everything about themselves. Then that right there ought to be a goal that you should have in your life. Can you say amen? Number three, here's if we want this sanctification process to take place in our lives, we have to go ask God to help get rid of some of the roadblocks in our life. All of us have some roadblocks or, or hindrances in our lives today. You're in this journey, and all of a sudden you hit a roadblock. All of a sudden you've been traveling down this road, and all of a sudden you slam the brakes because you hit this roadblock and you can't get past it. Let me tell you, I found, I found this out, that a lot of times, sometimes the roadblock is not as apparent as you see in this picture. A lot of those roadblocks are hidden and silent. And when you start talking to people, you find out there's some deep, deeper issues in their life. And there's some deeper things that are roadblocks that we couldn't see, that we weren't able to determine on the outside, but on the inside it was happening. So let me give you kind of an example of this. It'd be like if you were attacked by fleas. You guys ever, ever been attacked by fleas? And all of these fleas, and what happens when you're attacked by fleas? You start, you know, getting, plucking them out, right? And, you know, they start biting you. You start kind of getting rid of them and doing all of that. But if you're around a lot of fleas, man, they just keep coming back. You can be going like this, and next thing you know, another one got, uh, and, and, and it's almost like these roadblocks uh, in your life, you can try to pluck out the roadblock. You can try to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get it all done by myself. I'm gonna get rid of these things by myself. I don't need nobody. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna do it all by myself. And yet, this is what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter seven. Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit. Perfecting holiness, in other words, being set apart out of reverence and awe of God. So what does it mean, everything? Everything that is hindering your character, everything that is stunting your growth, everything that is putting a roadblock in your spiritual walk with God. And again, it could be a number of things. What are those roadblocks in your life right now? It could be lust. It could be jealousy. It could be anger. 
It, it could be stealing. It could be lying. It could be fornication. Right now you're, you're, you're with somebody you're not married with and, and you're doing stuff that you, only married couples should be doing. All of that stuff comes into play. What's the roadblock in your life right now? What are those hidden things right now that are hindering you? And if you missed this, I'm telling you this morning, or it could be like you like to control other people. You like to manipulate other people. And here's the thing about it. The reason why we don't like to give that up because it feels good controlling other people. We manipulate them by fear. We manipulate them by threatening them. I know there's nobody here. I'm just kind of preaching, okay, guys? Or... Or we have this adrenaline rush. We'll miss, you know, the rage. When we get this rage and we're angry, that adrenaline rush, we're going to miss that. So we don't want to change that. And so sometimes we say we want to change, but we don't change. We don't allow God to change us. I remember reading this. It said, if we lie down with dogs, you're going to get up with fleas. Maybe you ought to get away from some of the dogs in your life. You wonder why you got fleas while well, you keep lying with dogs. Look at what it says, Ephesians 4.22. It said, throw off your old evil nature and your former way of life, which is rotten through and through, full of lust and deception. You know, I've talked to people and they go, oh, yeah, I know. I'm, it's killing me, you know, pastor, I know, you know. It's rotten, I know, and all this, you know, but I, I'm going to just kind of handle it myself. And you're so embroiled in it that you can't even see the miracle that God wants to do in your life. And then, then you're saying, man, I don't understand. Why do the fleas keep coming back? Because you're not cooperating with God. God wants to do something in your life. So how do we cooperate with God? Are you ready for this? I think this will really help you. There are some steps. Again, God does his part, his power, his anointing, his grace. He can do it. He'll work the chain. But you have to cooperate. Are you ready for this? You got quiet in here, so I'm going to help you a little bit, okay? Number one, you have to recognize it. The first step of change is you have to recognize that you have some issues that you need changing in your life. Especially if you got a lot of flea bites, we can all see, but you have to, rec you got flea bites on you. You got to see that, okay? Recognize it. Number two, admitting. Taking responsibility to say, you know what? Stop blaming everybody else and take responsibility that it's not everybody else's fault. A lot of it is your own fault, okay? So you recognize it, you see, hey, I, man, I need some changing in this area. I see that. Number two, I'm, I'm going to stop blaming everybody, and I'm going I'm, I'm to admit, I'm going to take responsibility. And number three, are you ready for this? Confessing it. Confessing it. Saying, man, I, I need some help. Not just to God, here's the other part, but to someone else. The price of freedom many times is being, uh, uh, being able to confess that, you know what, I got a bad habit. I got some issues in my life. I've got some things that I need some change. It's being transparent and saying, man, this is the purpose of why there is a body, there is a community to help to pray for you, okay? And then after you confess it, sorry, guys, I'm dealing with a little bit of a cough here, is repentance. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. It's not just an apology. <coughs> excuse me. It's not just an apology or remorse or promise to never do it again. Repentance, listen to me, is the change of mind that produces a change of direction. So I'm not only sorry for what I've done, but now I'm changing my mind and I'm changing direction. And I'm surrendering it to God. Can you say amen? amen? I'm ready to get past my roadblock because I recognize it, I admit it, I confess it, and I repent. Somebody say amen. And that's what's going to help make the change in your life. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13. People who cover their sin will not prosper, 
But if they confess and forsake them, what? They will receive mercy. We believe it's okay, amen, to admit, hey, I've got issues, I've got problems. Join the club, amen. You want the messed up club? Join my club. I'm the president of the messed up club. Right here. And I can tell you, amen, that God will help you. If, you. if you recognize it, if you admit it, if you confess it, and you repent of it, you'll see a change in your life. The, the fourth thing I believe that we need to do, how many know when you're on a road, and we're talking about this road map to change. We're talking about the God who sanctifies. We're talking about Jehovah Mekadesh. In other words, he's the God that changes us. Is How many know when you're on this road, you constantly need to refuel? How many of you have ever been driving and all of a sudden, man, you see that it's getting close to the E, getting close to empty? And you can put that picture up. Yeah, go ahead. Now it's the time to do it. Okay, here it is. So you're driving and all of a sudden you see the gauge. And this is what men do. I don't know why we do this, but we say, man, I'm not going to pay that price. My gosh. I'm not, I'm not going to pay Chevron, no way. Exxon, no way. That's, not, that's always a high price, right? I don't know if you guys are Exxon, Chevron, okay. But I, I like the Arco price and the Costco prices. I'm a Sam Club guy too, man. Give me the Sam Club price. So if you're driving, you go, oh, man. I got, and then you go, I know it's going to be a lot of money. So you go, man, maybe I can make it to the next exit. And you're sweating it out. You don't want to tell your wife anything. Oh, boy, if, you, if your wife finds out. Oh, yeah, yep, everybody say, yep, yeah. <laughs> that you didn't stop at the last gas. Ne the next thing it says, next gas is five miles. Why didn't I stop? We have to refuel. In our walk with God, we need to refuel ourselves with God's presence and his grace. The reason why some of you quit early is you never refueled. You never let God renew you. Look at what it says in Psalm 23, 23. It says, he, talking about God, renews my strength and guides me along the right path. We need to spend time in the presence of God. We've got to learn how to refuel. Now, let me just tell you, I appreciate you coming and sitting here and listening to a message for 35, 40 minutes. But I'm going to tell you, this is not enough refuel for you. You got to read the Bible on your own. You got to pray. You got to spend some devotion with God. If you're depending on church to refuel you every Sunday and every Wednesday, that's not enough. I've met people that say, man, pastor, the longest I've ever met, went, you know, serving God, where I went three days where I actually read the Bible. Three days in a row, I can't do any more than that. Friend, you got to do it every day. Every day, you got to take some time to pray. Every day, you got to take some time to refuel. And the reason why people quit early, they get discouraged, they, they don't want to serve God anymore, is because you're not refueling yourself. And you can't depend on church to do that all the time. We're here to refuel you on Sunday, but see, Monday, Tuesday, you need to be reading the Bible. You need to be praying. You need to be talking to God yourself. Does that make sense? Get refueled. Let that sanctification start taking place. Look at what it said in 2 Peter chapter 1. It says this, as we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything we need, need living God, a godly life. So make every effort to apply these promises to your life. Then your faith, what, will produce a life of excellence. A life of moral excellence lead to knowing God better. Knowing God leads to self-control. Self-control leads to patient endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness. And godliness leads to love for other Christians. And finally, you will, have, you will grow to have a genuine love for everyone. So I'm just here to tell you that as you grow, as you develop, as God is sanctifying in your life, as you're refueling, it will be reflected in how God's working in your life. And part of it is loving other people. Part, part of it is showing grace for other people. And the last thing is this, number five, and write it down. We need to pause and celebrate how far we've come. That's good. Because there's a lot of times in our life today, we're looking at how far how far we've yet to arrive rather than how far we've come. 
We said, man, I, I, hey, I'm not there yet, but man, I've come a long way. Thank God for that. I've come a long way. I said, I'm not there yet, but I've come a long way. I can celebrate the progress. I can celebrate what God's done in my life. Psalm chapter 40, verse 5 says, Oh, Lord, my God, you've done many miracles for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. I've tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, and I would never come up to the end of them. In other words, there's so many things, God, you've done in my life. Celebrate. I, I told you guys before, I, I, I used to cuss. I was bad. I was, some of you, it's hard to believe that, but I was a cusser, man. My, my brothers would tell you, one of the first things they noticed after I came to church, like, man, you're not cussing anymore. And so you got to celebrate. If you haven't cussed for a week, let's throw a party. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> haven't cussed for a whole week. If you haven't gone out and spent money and, you know, wasted your money, you ought to throw a party, but I mean an economical party, not an expensive one, because that's more money, okay? Yeah. If, 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 you, if you haven't been bitter and unforgiving, celebrate that. Look at how far God has brought you. You're not there yet, but man, God's done a lot in your, work, your life so far. Can you say amen? So I want to encourage you in the journey of sanctification that Jehovah Mekadesh is the God that sanctifies you. He wants to change you today. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is powerful. God, even as we pray today that you are a God that sanctifies, you're a God that changes us. And so Lord, as we sit in this building today, there's not a person in this building Lord, that can honestly say they don't need change. Every single one of us, God, we need to change. We need to change the way we think. We need to ch change the way we look at our own lives. We need to be honest, Lord. We, we, we need to admit. First of all, we need to recognize, God, that we need change. We need to admit it. We need to confess it. We need to repent and turn from it. So God, today I pray as people of God that we just be honest. Lord, can we just be a little bit more transparent today? Let's stop trying to hide and impress everybody. Lord, you know our hearts today. We need you.